to clarify that a little bit right now, is that you can always call the Department of Public Health and get some questions answered. If you, if you have a question in the code and you say, I don't understand this, can you help me out with it? And they're more than happy to do that. The one thing that they cannot do is order local health to do anything. By law, each local health department within its community has the final enforcement of the regulations. So DPH cannot call up Boston Inspectional Services and say, you must do this and you must reimburse this. It just can't be done. As you'll see when we get near the end, when we get into hearing process and everything, there are remedies for anyone who has a problem with the regulations and for uh, their local health department. So just make sure, you know, just understand that and we'll move along. So as you can see, the code is 105 CMR 410 minimum standards of fitness for human habitation, state sanitary code chapter two. The regulatory number 105 CMR is very simple. 105 designates Department of Public Health, CMR is code of Massachusetts regulations and 410 just means housing. Now you'll see that it also says minimum standards and that's what these standards are. They are the bare bones minimum He's not expected to everyone live in a plaza or a multi-million dollar home with everything they want. There are minimum standards, just that, that people, the very basics that we believe people should have. The, it sets, as I said, it sets forth the minimum wise housing standards in the st that were established by Mass General Law in 1972. So what happens is the legislature, the representative in the Senate, will give authority to an agency to do something. And so they gave the authority to Department of Public Health to write these regulations. So that's where it comes from. The regulations are written and promulgated, meaning they're passed and enforced by the department and enforced by local boards of health, inspectional services, whatever the, the local um, uh, structure is within that community. This has been a very long process. I was in charge with overseeing this process until I retired in 2021 in, in December and told them I would go back when they finally were promulgated, which I did for a few months to do training throughout the state. So we started this process in 2009. So it was a very political process and lots of reviews, comments all throughout the, the entire process. The initial amendments went to public comment in 2027 and 2019. Now this says there were nearly 350 comments through those two public periods, but we actually had over 500. People who commented, and you understand when a comment comes in on regulation, the department has to log it, has to um, explain to the, the um, our board, which is the Public Health Council, what the comments were and what our response was gonna be. And then we also had to post a response. So. It, it does make a difference if you make comments because somebody has to respond to those. So we had about, I think it was about 530, not 350. And that included people who were parts of boards of health, many landlord associations, tenant associations, homeless shelter operators, because we brought them into the fold somewhat with the regulations and advocacy organizations like legal services and groups that, that help with these issues. Our boss, who was the uh, Public Health Council, passed these regulations in October 12th of 2022 with the understanding they would not go into effect until sometime in May. And the reason for that was it's such a major change for everyone. And there's a lot of information that needs to get out and a lot of guidance documents written and drafted and approved that we knew it would take at least six months to get through that. And it wasn't fair to just suddenly say, well, here it is Monday and they're in effect. We didn't, we didn't want to do it that way. So I still say we now and then, I'm no longer with Department of Public Health. I retired in 2021. I went back uh, last October and I finished up in April, but I remain a consultant to local public health. And uh, that's how and why uh, Inspectional Services asked me to give this presentation as I was the point person at the department for those 17 years when it comes to the housing code. 
The purpose for the revisions were very simple. Significantly reorder and add clarifying language for ease, ease of interpretation. If any of you ever tried to read the old regs, you're, you're not alone if you were confused. Uh, they weren't written very well. They were written in the, 19, in the late 1960s with minor tweaks here and there so that it was, it was not written in a way that the, anyone in general would be able to understand them. So we tried to clean that up and ease the number of questions coming in saying, what does this mean? So we tried to make it very clear. We also wanted to align with and incorporate standards from existing state codes. The building code changes and revises their regulations every three years. The plumbing code has done it at least two times since our last major change. The electrical code, fire code, all of those are updated on a regular basis. The last major renovation for the housing code was in 1997. And before that, when it was written in 1969, or 1960, it underwent a little bit of renovation, uh, uh, revision in 1969. So it, it was really dragging behind everyone else and we needed to stay in tune with them and update them. It address emerging issues. Everybody knows that uh, uh, all the rage has been tiny homes and we've also brought in a new um, classification for housing called alternative housing. And I'll get into that a little bit near the end. Climate change flexibilities. If you're a property owner, I'm sure somewhere down the line, when it gets to May and the heating season is still on until June 15th and it's 95 degrees outside, people are screaming at you to turn on the air conditioning. And according to the regulations, unless you got a variance, you couldn't turn it on. So we've addressed a way for that to work a little bit smoother. And just, just different uh, technical updates, wording, that sort of thing, classifications. And that. So the other purpose is we provide enforcement guidance, flexibility, and clarity for the boards of health. As I said, they are the point for the enforcement. And we spend many, many hours each year just answering questions for local health um, as they do their inspections and they have to interpret things and they have to, to work with you and they have to work with occupants. So we've spent a lot of time working and supporting them. One of the things we tried to do is reorganize the regulations because they were all over the place. Uh, so we put them in different in, in standard categories, which coincide with the trainings we've always done. We had a mass fit housing training, three-day housing training for local health. And that was to explain the regulations, explain the requirements for inspections and legal service and, and all those things. And we had that broken into categories, so it just made sense to do the same way. So we have a general administration, which I'm gonna review a little bit. Definitions, I'm only gonna talk about a few because there's several new ones, but a lot of old ones. I just wanna hit a couple highlights. Building and plumbing are grouped together, electrical and fire are grouped together, health and safety are the overall sanitation standards, and then enforcement procedures at the end. I'm gonna talk a little bit about enforcement procedures so you have an understanding of, of what local health is required to do. And the regulations by state law tell them what they have to do, but the department isn't the one telling them that. It's these regulations that say, you will do this with these regulations for inspections and for enforcement. So generally, the purpose of the regulations is to provide minimum standards to protect the health, safety, and well-being of occupants. And we use the word occupant, we never use the word tenant. And the reason for that is tenancy tends to lean more towards a legal description and legal contract as opposed to occupants. And occupants are anyone who are living in a residential structure. So it applies to them. We, we used to hear arguments, and I don't know if that still happens, but we used to get arguments, well, they're not on the lease. It doesn't apply to them. And that's not the case when it comes to the housing code. There may be other legal contract laws, things that come into play, but when it comes to the housing code, somebody's living somewhere, they are protected under the housing code. And that goes for owners as well as occupants who are renting. The regulations apply to all residences defined in the code. And I'm gonna show you what that is. Residences must also adhere to state building code and all specialized codes. So this, this set of regulations doesn't supersede the building code or fire code or plumbing code, nor do their regulations supersede us. Everybody has to work together. For general provisions, the owner, and th this is something what we have put in here 
is new in print, but has always been the philosophy of the Department of Public Health. So we wanted to have the opportunity to, to say, we've always felt this way, so we want to get it in writing. The owner is responsible to provide and maintain all necessary equipment except where noted. The owner may only remove optional equipment when a residence is vacant or prior to new tenancy. And that means equipment that isn't required in the code of washer, dryer, um, air conditioning, garbage disposal, whatever the case may be. A lot of times when something breaks and it's not required by the code, some, uh, some owners want to just remove it rather than repair it. And we have always held back from the 60s, that if it's there when it, when it's, while it's occupied, it has to stay there and be maintained, replaced, repaired, whatever the case may be, until a, a new a, a tenancy ends and before a new one begins, then you can get rid of that stuff. And the occupant is responsible to keep their residence in a sanitary condition. This isn't a one-way leaning code that just goes after owners and it just doesn't go after occupants. We assign the responsibility of repairs to whomever it is, is required throughout the code. So we want to make it very clean or very clear, occupants are responsible to keep everything clean and respect the units and the structural elements in there. Um, we try to clarify a little bit for all properties are either a residence or temporary housing. And I'll show you the difference between the two. Residences include single and multifamily homes, rooming houses, homeless shelters for the first time, and that new alternative housing which we're gonna talk about. Temporary housing includes seasonal properties, generally not intended for permanent occupancy and mobile housing, including tents. Now, what we're talking about is cabins in the woods, that sort of vacation type property that is rented or used on a part-time basis by the, the owners of the property. Amendments expand to the specific housing types permissible and tailor the requirements to allow for flexibility while maintaining local board oversight. There, we tried to give local health the ability and the authority to act if they chose to, but not make it a mandate when it comes to some of the oversight of this of temporary housing. The revisions permit some types of housing that do not meet all housing code standards, as long as they meet certain requirements and are approved by the local board of health. Uh, for example, seasonal cabins, tiny homes, um, tiny homes, and properties owned by individuals wanting to live off the grid. This is more for an owner-occupied uh, single unit structure, uh, not really applies to rental, but there is a movement throughout the state for people to have a much lower environmental footprint with their housing, and we have just reacted to this new movement. Requirements and exemptions specific to homeless shelter operations have been has been included because we never had homeless shelters in there, and that's seen throughout the code. One of the definitions I want to explain, I know this is a lot of words, but this is a very important definition for you. This is not new. And it says that compliance with accepted standards means meeting all the requirements of 410 and correcting any violation in a work person like manner in accordance with accepted building, plumbing, heating, gas fitting, electrical wiring standards, or advisories issued by the department so that the residence or cited item or component is returned to its intended function or use. Materials and equipment shall be appropriate for the use intended, affected for areas, uh, affected areas shall be left in a properly clean condition. When licenses or permits are required to perform the work necessary to correct the violation, including but not limited to plumbing, building, wire, electrical, heating, all those um, compliance shall also mean that such licenses, permits have been obtained and any conditions, requirements imposed by licenses have been met. In short, you have to use the proper materials that are you that are you use the materials that are supposed to be used for whatever the type of repair you're doing. You're supposed to bring the component or whatever it is you're repairing back to its original state. You have to clean up the area once all of the work has been done. And if permits or licensed people are required, you have to use them. And why this is important is you may, you or someone may do some repairs that you think have, have solved the problem, but if it doesn't meet this requirement because you need to license people or you, ha you have the pull permits, whatever the case may be, or you use the wrong materials, the local health department does not have to accept those that work. So I know sometimes people will say, 
I did all the work. Why didn't you approve it? It's probably because one of these conditions haven't been met. So this is a critical one for you to understand as you go through taking care of your properties. This also comes into play when we get near condemnations. Condition making a unit unfit for human habitation is in accordance with the general laws, 127 A and B, that, that are stated in the law that will justify the closing, securing of a unit, condemning it, and keeping it vacated. It should mean violations which pose such immediate harm or threat of harm to an occupant or to the public that other legal remedies cannot be reasonably expected to bring about a removal of condition with sufficient speed to prevent serious harm. That means that a unit may be, a, or portion thereof a building, may have to be condemned because it's just too dangerous. It doesn't mean, uh, as some people think, oh, they condemn it, they're gonna knock the thing down. That's not what it means. It means they can't, no one can live in this area, but it can be fixed. The only reason it would be condemned and ordered vacated is it can't be, the, the repairs just can't be done in a reasonably quick period of time. The word reasonably is subjective, but it's the it's in the eye of the local health department. So there is no definition for reasonable. It's what they believe to be reasonable. Another one is condition which may endanger material impair the health and safety and well-being of the occupant means the existence of a condition listed in 105 CMR 410.630. That's just a paragraph, the section of the code that you look at. This comes straight out of the legislature and the law that ordered Department of Public Health to list those items that are deemed as condition deemed to endanger. And what those items do, if they exist, is it may allow occupants to exercise their legal rights and remedies. That's been a sheet of paper that we passed out for years. I'm sure most of you know what that is. They can, they can with, uh, withhold rent. They can use their rent to pay for repairs and look for reimbursement, but it all has to be done in a legal way. So it doesn't give them carte blanche to just say, I'm not going to pay my rent. There's a lot of different conditions. And whenever an occupant talks to the Department of Public Health about this, we always tell them you need to get in touch with the lawyer. You can't just hold your withhold your rent because that doesn't fly. Residents, this is a new term. We used to have everything, we say dwelling unit, rooming unit, condominium unit. We got sick and tired of it, so we had wanted to, to use a shorter term. So residence means every building or structure used for or intended for human habitation and every other structure or condition located within the physical boundaries of the lot line. This is very important because if you have a shed, a barn, a garage, some other outbuilding in the property, it is subject to the housing code. And I know people will say there's nobody living in it. It doesn't matter because it could pose a threat to, to the general public. So if it's on the property, it all falls within the housing code. A residence includes, but not limited to, a single or multi-unit structures, rooming houses, manufactured homes, which are like the trailer parks, homeless shelters, temporary housing, alternative housing, and condominiums. So it's a general term that covers all of them. And rooming house I put up, I, I don't know if it's really necessary. I think everybody knows what, what the rooming house is, but just so that you, uh, you understand exactly what we're talking about, when you look down at the bottom is that rooming houses include, they're not limited to boarding houses, hotels, motels, inns, lodging houses, bed and breakfast, bed and breakfast operations, dormitories, fraternity and sorority houses, hostels, and other similar residences. Now, the reason we have so many different terms in there, like boarding house, hotel, motel, in lodging house, because there's so many different laws over the years that apply to the same thing. Every time they wrote the law, they called it something else. So we had to put all those things in there and make sure you understand and everyone understands what we mean. We just put it under the umbrella of rooming house so that we didn't have to keep listing that, that long list every time. So now we're going to get into some of the new things that are within the code. And when you look at the code, when you see these numbers like 410-100, 410-120, these are just just sections of the code and you can go right to them. You can find them in the table of comments. The changes, kitchen facilities, adds minimum size of an oven and refrigerator is provided by the owner. And that's, uh, we, we have listed that in the, in the code. The one thing, the caveat we have here is that if the rental agreement requires the occupant to provide these things, then that's okay. It just has to be in a rental agreement. And I think that's one of the areas 
where, where people who aren't aware of the regulations get themselves into trouble because there's a lot of things that you could put into a rental agreement which, which places the burden on the occupant. Now there's some things you can't because we list that throughout the code that it's, it's the owner is always responsible for it and you can't delegate that authority. But there are some things you can do and take a look, as you look through the code, you'll see things like this that will say, unless otherwise listed in the rental agreement, that is a signal to you that if you write a, a legal rental agreement, you may not have to do some of the things that are required. We talked about upgrading um, other, other agencies' requirements. So all we did is we wanted these, these humus and composting toilets. Incinerating toilets have been approved by other agencies for quite some time. So we just wanted to list them. A privy outhouse. Um, I, I know I don't know if there are even any outhouses in, in uh, Boston, but that's what we're talking about. And that just talks about the location of where that privy can be as long as it's an existing one. Uh, there's really no way to get a new one built. So that's what we cover that. We made a change in hot water. The standard hot, uh, standard hot water for all kitchens, for all sinks, is 110 to 130, 110 degrees to 130 degrees. The only thing we changed, because the code for many years, the code for, for bathtubs and showers was really 100 degrees to 112 degrees, and nobody ever knew it because we didn't have the authority to put it in the code, but we made those interpretations forever. We were approached by the plumbing department, the plumbing board one day, and they said they're rewriting their regulations, and they have studies that show that a range up to 112 is a perfect environment for the growth of legionellosis, and if it goes up to 120, it will kill that. So they asked if we would make that change, and we did. So now for bathtubs and showers, the temperature range is 110 to 120, which I think makes it easier because the overall requirement of 110 to 130 for other sinks, if you set it at just, just under 120, constant everywhere, you're, you're within the code no matter what. So it's something to think about. Heating systems, we have we have finally come through and identified what is prohibited. Parlor heaters with it with fuel within 42 inches. This is not the gas parlor heater that you find in the older homes. It's a big unit. It's vented to the outdoors. There's gas pipe coming right to it. Those are okay. What we're talking about is any kind of heater that has the fuel tank within 42 inches of the flame. That's what we're talking about. And those big parlor heaters are direct piping so they don't fit that. So that's that's not what we're talking about. Portable wick type space heaters, anything that's got a burning wick, obviously that's not any, gonna be anything that we would approve. And unvented propane gas uh, heaters that aren't approved by the fire code. The fire department has approved one kind of, of um, not vented propane or gas space heater. They say it burned cleaner than a gas stove. The only thing that they say is it does not meet the requirements of a heating system and they can't be used in bedrooms. So this isn't something that you could say, I'm gonna get a bunch of them, spread them throughout because I don't want to, I don't want to keep my furnace going. That's not how it works. That's that's not gonna be allowed. Any, any uh, device combusting fuel has to be vented to the outdoors, except for those gas heater, gas and propane heaters that the fire, uh, fire department has approved. Electric, gas, electric and gas dryers have to be vetted to the outdoors, not up into the attic, looped over into a closet, except electric dryers listed and labeled as ventless by the manufacturer. And when we put this in the code and did the training to local health, they said, how am I going to know this? And our response was put the onus on the owner to prove it. So if you put installing these devices and they're ventless things, hold on to your paperwork, hold on to the instructions. So if you ever question, you can just say, here it is, it's it, ventless by the manufacturer and everything's fine. You won't be held to that standard. Electric range hoods have to be vented to the outdoors, again, unless they're labeled as ventless. This is a good tip for you guys. Hold on to anything that gets installed. You have a plumber put some of this stuff in, tell them you want the manual for it that shows that it's ventless and duct, uh, ductless. This is a big one I talked about before. It's room temperatures or the, I mean, the exterior temperatures. Uh, it, it's just been, there's no way that you can really react to the thing in a, a fast period of time. And we all know that 
in May, it gets the end, near the end of May, it gets very hot. Um, there is no requirement for air conditioning. So it was, it was always a situation where someone would say, I can't turn the heat off because the code doesn't allow it. We had a looser interpretation of that saying that as long as you have the ability to get the heat going, it doesn't have to be on. So if you wanted to turn air conditioning on, it would be okay. I know the big units though, it takes a couple of days and it's expensive to do. We know that's not gonna work for you. So what we tried to do is set up a, a situation now where we shorten the period. Uh, instead of June 15th, we go to May 31st. The, the local health, I'll say the local health authority, not just the boards of health, will now have the ability to adjust the number of heating days either on the front end when the heating season starts or the back end when the heating season ends. And what I mean by that is in the past, if any owner wanted to start providing air conditioning and be absolved from the heating requirements, they had to get a variance from the Board of Health. That could take a couple weeks. So, I mean, the heating season would be over by then and it's not gonna do you any good. You're still gonna get screamed at by everybody. So what's gonna happen now with all the, all the, the information that everybody has, uh, right on your phone, you can look at the 15-day the forecast, you know what's going on. So the Board of Health could, at one of their regular legal meetings, say, based on the forecast that we see, we are going to either end, delay, whatever end you're, you're looking at for the heating season as of today, and then post it on the website. So there's no longer a situation where an owner has to go through the variance, and it's going to be a little bit easier for boards of health to react to the process of ending the seating season or delaying it to react to the heat uh, as we saw. It. it was very strange this year because this was the first year in a long time we had people calling and complaining because at the end of the heating season, it got very cold and they wanted the heat turned back on. So it's like, you know, you're not always gonna be able to win, but that was the plan we had. So keep that in mind as, as you get into next year. Uh, provision for meeting, uh, metering and, and electricity or gas. The owner, uh, this is new, provides access to the occupant's electrical distribution panel when the occupant pays for electricity consistent with the Massachusetts Electric Code. That's what they require. Now, there's two situations we have here. The first one is that the code actually says that the occupant shall always, shall always have access to their electrical panel, but there's two conditions. If the occupant is paying for the electricity themselves, then they have unrestricted access. They have to be able to get to the panel whenever they want. If the owner is paying for the electricity, they still have access to the panel, but they would have to contact the owner to have a property manager or a representative or the owner themselves unlock the room that the panel is in, but they can't refuse to give them access to it. It's just that now it's a situation where the owner has to provide the means to get to it, but they always have access in, a, in two different circumstances. Natural mechanical ventilation, as time goes on, there are more and more units that have vent fans in them. I think the day will come when all the old, all the older buildings will be retrofitted where there are no, are no um, situations without mechanical ventilation. So natural ventilation is a window, not very practical in the winter time. And in most cases, I understand that not all, in most cases, it's not that hard to put mechanical ventilation through a wall, through a window or something like that. So the Board of Health can require mechanical ventilation if they find that natural ventilation use of a window doesn't work. So just understand that that, that could be coming through. That's new. This only applies to an owner who has a building where they supply linens, uh, hotels, inns. We wanted to finally put something in there that said you have to, you have, to have laundering of these um, uh, blankets and pillows and mattress, all that stuff. I um, mean, here's a schedule here, I showed you that. And you'll be very happy to know that we took these standards directly from the prison standards. The program I work for, the state inspectors uh, are responsible for inspecting state-owned properties, which included all state and county correctional facilities, all the prisons. And these are the standards that have to be met for the inmates. So now we've got everybody on the same on the same level. 
doesn't affect I mean, it doesn't affect any of your rental units unless you provide the linens. So just be aware of that. Installation and maintenance for the owner. Conventional cooktop and oven and refrigerator with freezer are required unless the rental agreement specifies the occupant does. This is the one of the, one of the requirements I was telling you. It's an option here, but you have to put it in the rental unit, in the, in the rental lease. In writing, you can't just tell them, oh, yeah, you got to bring your own. One thing to be aware of, if the occupant provides, and we went through this with local health, if the occupant provides these facilities and they break, the occupant would be on the hook to fix them because they brought them. And that's why you want the documentation in your leases. One of the problems we ran into is that there was one, one situation where a, an occupant had the Closed dryer, they provided it, they moved out. New occupants moved in, the closed dryer remained, it eventually broke. And at that point, the owner was on the hook because the original occupant no longer provided it. So what we're saying as an owner, and I owned rental property for many, many years, and it's not always convenient, but you gotta do some walkthroughs of your property once in a while and see what's going on. Because that owner was not happy that they were on the hook for that dryer. So just be aware of, of that situation. Uh, following any repairs, when you have to do work, all the debris has to properly be disposed and the area cleaned up. Can't just leave crap all over the place, it's gotta be cleaned up. And any surface that was subject to moisture, whether it was uh, part of the reason that you had to repair anyhow, a leaky pipe, a hole in the roof, or your cleaning materials, your cleaning solutions, made everything wet, you have to have that dried out within 48 hours. The 48 hours is the, the tipping point for the growth of mold. If you get it within 48 hours, you've just about eliminated the opportunity for mold to grow. And once you get mold going in a, in a home, if any of you have experienced that, you can know what a kind of a nightmare that could turn into if it starts spreading and all of a sudden you got to start ripping places, ripping the rooms apart. For locks, we've always said this, we just never put it in, in, the, in the regulations. So this was our opportunity. The owner has to provide keys except for homeless shelters for the main entry door, the occupant's unit and areas common to the occupant. Now, what do we mean is like that, it could be that situation with the, with the basement and the electrical panel. If they, they it would be almost considered a, a common area because they have to have access to it, but you could give them a key. A lot of times owners want to keep that locked because they don't want people just walking in and out of there. And that makes perfect sense. We, we understand that. So we're just saying that's that's the kind of thing we're talking about. If you have electrical panels, say, in the closets out in a common area, but you keep them locked, the occupant just has to have the, the key for that. Electrical supply and illumination. Think of illumination, not lights, because what we're, we, we we're talking about is being able to illuminate rooms and provide electricity. In the kitchen, this has always been our stance, but it's just now in writing. Two wall receptacle outlets, in addition to the outlets used for a refrigerator and the cooktop and ovens. First of all, you're not gonna use the 220 outlet for the cooktop and oven for anything else. But in most cases, you're not gonna have access to the refrigerator outlet because it's behind the refrigerator. There are times, I know, but you have to have two separate ones in addition to those two that are required. Spaces other than kitchen, habitable rooms, and bathrooms. This is important. Electric light switches or sensors and fixtures, if the light from an adjacent area does not provide sufficient illumination for all of these areas. Now, what does that mean? It, it never fails. For years, we've gotten calls from local health struggling with this, and their main question is, do, does the owner have to put a light in the closet? And it's usually, do you have to put a light in the bedroom closet? And we would always respond with the question, if you turn the light on in the bedroom, can they see into the closet? And 99% of the time, the inspector would say yes. And then we said, it's sufficiently illuminated and you don't have to. That's what we're talking about here. If the room next to where you are provides enough light to light the area so that you can see safely, you don't have to put a light in there. Other people wanted to know if I, what would I, if could I take one of those stickums and put it in the uh, stick ups and put them in the closet if I wanted to? Yeah, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But just so you understand how this, this adjacent stuff works, this does not apply to the outside. Porches, stairways have to have lighting 
for illumination. You can't say the parking lot next door lights are always on, um, there's a street light out there. None of that stuff counts. It has to be on the property and attached to your premises. However, we we for many years, we weren't able to say, we're not just talking about switches. You can put sensors, timers, anything else that provides light when it's needed, and that's fine. And that's what most people are doing now. They're going with different kinds of different kinds of lighting. And it's that's fine as long as it provides the lighting when it's needed. Owner manager contact information and notice of rights and remedies, the telephone number provided, and that has to be listed in any property, rental property, a telephone number where someone can call to get service. Must be regularly checked at least every 12 hours unless an alternative number has been provided if they're temporary unavailable. That means if you give a phone number, you post a phone number, that has to be checked. And if you or your property manager goes away for a week or two, they say, I'm not going to be here, call this number, then that number is going to be subject to, a, to monitoring every 12 hours. It's going to be very easy for local help. They can leave a message and they can wait and see how long it takes to get back. So just be aware of that. And the owners also uh, can provide or post the notice of occupants, legal rights and remedies. That's online. You can, um, if you want to just stick it on a bulletin board, their, their mailboxes, wherever you want to, or you can hand it to them. Some people said, I'm going to put it in the lease, but whatever you want to do, but that has to be provided. Minimum square footage, every rooming unit shall have at least 100 square feet when, um, it, this is really written kind of poorly, we have to already make an interpretation on this. What we're saying here is that a rooming unit can have as little as 100 square feet if, it contains a single room and there's only one occupant. Most of the most of the rooming units we've run into average around 125, 120, somewhere in there square feet. Well, you can have it this small if you meet those conditions. We combined the size of bedrooms and we went with the less restrictive size. So it used to be in a rooming house, they had to be this big. In a rental, rental unit, they had to be this big. Now they're all the same size and we went with the smaller requirements to make it easier to meet. So in any residence, it's bedroom has to have a minimum of 70 square feet for one occupant and 50 square feet for each occupant when used by more than one. Simply what this means, you have one person in the bedroom, got to have 70. You have two people in the bedroom, has to be 100. It's not 50 plus 70, it's 50 plus 50. So that you just have to get the size that way. Homeless shelters are exempt from that. Uh, we also put a list in of what homeless shelters are exempt from. Um, we thought it was nice, it'd be a good idea to have something in one spot, even though we were told we didn't have to. But you can see as you run down through this list, if you operate a homeless shelter, these requirements you're not met to. The, the one to, to really bring into um, play here is minimum square footage right in the middle of the screen. Um, we, we're not requiring the minimum square footage, but we are suggesting that you get a separation of six feet head to head. That way, if you alternate the bed, so it's foot to toe, foot to, foot to head that way, that you could probably meet it. It'll be close as possible. And for pre-occupancy inspection for pests, which I'm going to get into, uh, they're not required to do as long as they have a, if they provided a pest management policy with integrated pest management practices. And most of the ones that we, when we toured throughout the state, when writing these regulations met that requirement. So they're not off the hook for pests. Owner's responsibility to maintain building and structural elements in the event of leaks and or flooding. The owner shall ensure all surfaces are dried within 48 hours from the time they are notified when somebody calls you and tell you I got a plumbing leak or something's leaking or the end of the event, whichever is sooner. End of the event, get a big rainstorm like we've been having. Um, you can't try, you can't hold a requirement to dry within 48 hours if it's still raining and still getting flash floods. But once, once the uh, rain stops, the event stops, you gotta get it dried out in 48 hours to prevent the mold. Elimination of pests. The, uh, this is one where we tried to, tried to, move the owners along a little bit in taking pre-active or preemptive action for monitoring pests in their units. So the owners and occupants are responsible for control one, in certain circumstances. A one, a single family home 
the occupant is responsible for keeping the unit free of pests and paying for any pest elimination, extermination. However, the owner will be held responsible for that. If when the inspector comes to do an inspection, they walk around the building and they see that there are holes in the foundation and areas that allow for pest infiltration. So if the owner hasn't maintained the building and maintained the structure to keep pests out, the occupant's not gonna be held responsible. If the owner has maintained the building, then the occupant is gonna be responsible. Anytime there's a residence with more than one unit, the owner is responsible. That's not new. It's always been that way, but we just put it up here to, as, as a reminder. And this also applies to homeless shelters as far as um, responsibility. They are, the homeless shelter operator is responsible for that. Elimination of pests. This is a new section. Um, it, it covers what we've always had. The owners and occupants must provide access to common areas, interior dwelling unit, and follow pest applicators instructions. This means if you hire someone to, to treat for pests, a lot of times it's I mean, when bed bugs were all the rage and everything, whatever the pest management firm requires, the owner and the occupants have to follow. I know there's million, million, well, not millions, there are several situations where it's like in a hoarding situation, they have bed bugs and the, the, the mess, pest management firm would say, we can't treat, there's too much stuff in here. We had to get those units cleaned out because they have to follow that. Occupants are required to maintain their dwelling and rooming unit in a sanitary manner. If they're, if they're not cleaning their surfaces, if they're leaving it dirty and cluttered, the, the Board of Health has the authority and we've encouraged them to cite the occupant to get it cleaned up. Owners must conduct pre-occupancy inspection to determine the presence of pests. Homeless shelters are not required, but they have their own. Now, well, here's, here's what we're talking about here. All you have to do is to walk through. You can have somebody else do the walkthrough before a new tenant moves in, new occupant moves in. You walk through. You walk around and see if there's any signs of pests. You, you don't have to hire anyone. You can if you want, but it's not a financial burden in that you don't have to hire someone for it. When you do the walkthrough, you look at the bottom of the slide and you'll see that it says you have to document what you did for monitoring presidents. When I did, when I did the walkthrough, if I found an issue, I fixed it. You write it down in, in just loose leaf binder, whatever you want to put it in, and document the results or actions taken, including repairs, application, follow-up, inspections, whatever the case may be. So it's if you do a walkthrough, you write down when you did it. If you found something you had to repair for pest entry, you just write down that you did it. If you um, had to have somebody come in and do treatment, you just write down that they did it. And you hold on to that information because if the board, and what we're trying to avoid here is situations where it changes occupancy and now all of a sudden the occupant says, well, it's always been here. We don't know if maybe they caused it. So this way it's kind of a, a preemptive strike here, but you hold on to this documentation because if the local health department has to come do an inspection for pests, they have the right to ask to see this information. So you can put it in a three ring binder or those spiral notebooks. It doesn't matter what it is. As long as you just write something down, just stick it somewhere. This is the requirement for the pesticide applicators. This is not new. This comes from Department of Agriculture's requirements. The pesticide applicator must provide 48 hours notice prior to application. Pre-notification documentation is the name and address of the company, proposed date of the application, where they're going to be treating and the names of the the um, um, of the solutions or treatment, whatever that may be, uh, the ingredients, EPA registrations, all that. They have to provide that stuff. If they don't, uh, we've always advised that I know legally this this holds true. If they don't, then occupants or owners can say, no, you're not coming in because I don't have that information. So just be aware. This is an area, what we tried to do is uh, here is put the, clarify that local health enforcement for handling of rubbish is in accordance with what their community requires. In other words, it doesn't do us at the at department to list all these different requirements of ways to handle things and then find out that half of the, half of the towns throughout the state do it some other way. So all we're saying here, and we'll go through what this is quickly, all we're saying here is 
depending on what your town requires, the health department will decide if the owner's responsible or if the occupant's responsible. And it's it's really that simple. Uh, simple. This first bullet is not new. Provide a sufficient number of receptacles to store rubbish and recyclables. Always been that way, but we understand now that many communities have recycling programs. So if they do, then the owner has to provide the receptacles for recy recycling. If the owner provides a dumpster, it's got to be located convenient to the occupants, so no objectionable odors to enter the residence. And in accordance with 527 CMR, that's the fire code, because the fire department has permitting authority over the location of dumpsters as well. Dumpsters should be placed on impervious surface, which means on a hard surface, not the dirt, and covered and protected from leaking. If you got a drain hole in there, you got to have the plug in there. The, this is for collection now for the occupant. The occupant is responsible for proper placement of refuse in the owner provided receptacles in the dumpster, suitable container provided by the owner, or according to the municipality's requirement, which leads us into the next bullet. The occupant is responsible for fees in municipalities where there's a pay as you throw program. If you have to buy bags, city bags, the occupants have to pay for them, and they're the ones that have, are responsible for putting them out on the, the proper time for collection. We used to get calls all the time. People complaining, the owner's not coming to pick up my bags and take them out to the street, and the owner's not responsible for that. The occupant is. So we wanted to clarify this. Uh, respond, the um, put out for collection in accordance with what the uh, municipality requires, but no earlier than the day before collection. Plastic bags can be used for collection unless the Board of Health or your municipality objects to that and says, no, you won't do it. A lot of them have gone to the totes, the wheeled totes where you've got trash in one, recycles in the other. So that's the sort of thing that we're talking about. Here's some of the, we, we've gotten through all those requirements now. Now we're going to get a little bit of the regulatory enforcement. Um, hopefully shed a little light on why boards of health are doing what they're doing. Um, it's, it, this is where the requirements come, up, come down on them. Inspection upon request, and this is not new either. The Board of Health shall expect the residents in common areas upon receiving a request orally in writing by telephone, electronic message, regardless of whether the occupant has previously notified the owner of the alleged condition. We've had some people suggest that the occupant must first notify the owner. The problem you run into there is proving that notice was given. It was just too burdensome on everyone so that we just left it the way it was. Uh, whether or not there's an eviction litigation or other dispute between the occupant and the owner, and the occupant is requesting to be anonymous or ask their name be kept confidential. Now, being kept confidential can be can be that way until the case is closed and then it becomes public as part of the public record. Board of Health has to keep a record, and I left just left in here and there just to show you that, that they have some heavy requests of what they're supposed to do, and any decision not to conduct an inspection requested by a person who is not the occupant, if they decide that they don't, they're not going to do an inspection because it wasn't an occupant, they have to say why. Now, the only requirement we have put on the Board of Health is if it's for, if someone who's not living in the unit complains, the Board of Health has to do an investigation. And by investigation means they look into it to see if it's worth trying to do an inspection. Because in many cases, you get a neighbor or someone complaining and the occupant doesn't want an inspection. If the occupant doesn't want the inspection, unless the Board of Health thinks that they have to get a warrant because it may be very dangerous, they can't go in. So they would just close it and they have to, they have to keep a record as to why they've done that. Uh, the inspector has to, and this is this what you're going to see when, when inspections are done. The inspector shall record all violations. The occupants is informed they have a right to a comprehensive. If the complaint is a lack of heat during the heating season, then they have the right to delay it and just do the heat. But they have to go back and do the inspection uh, within one business day when a violation is part of those conditions deemed to endanger and five or any others. Where an inspection reveals conditions that present an imminent threat, then the Board of Health may delay the rest of the inspection and act immediately to take care of that. A verbal summary of the inspections given to the occupant or their representative and a written summary provided if requested. So they are always required to inform the occupants. If the occupant wants it in writing, 
Some, com some communities will give them a copy of the inspection report. That's a, a decision by each health department. But from a state perspective and interpretation, if they want a written summary, they could put that on a yellow piece of paper from a yellow pad and hand it to them. So it's whatever the community wants to do when they have to provide a written one. This very simple, just areas that we have said you must take a look at. Now there's always a caveat is the inspector cannot put themselves in danger. So if the, if the areas are not accessible without putting themselves at risk, they don't have to go there. So we're just, and you'll see that they're really the same thing, but we just wanted to make sure for different in, uh, instances, these are the areas that you're gonna, they're gonna hit the common areas, the attics, basements, if they can get into them, not gonna have to climb ladders to get in the attic, anything like that, and the, the exterior. Um, moisture. If the inspector discovers excessive moisture, excess moisture or appearance of mold, they shall inspect potential sources. Now these, most, two of these are easy. Plumbing leak, structural defects, that's easy. If they are looking at mechanical, natural or natural ventilation, air conditioning, they're not experts. They don't have to be experts. So what we've said is if we are going down the basement and you see ductwork that's falling down or something's dripping off of it, that's what you can know. But you're not gonna have to put a flashlight, pen light in your mouth and crawl through all the ductworks or anything like that. So it's within reason. This last part is, I'm gonna read it now, try and put a little bit simpler. Environmental testing should not be required to determine the existence of excess moisture or mold. When testing is conducted, the re results should not be used as a sole determination of excess moisture or mold. In other words, if an occupant sends a, a mold report from an environmental firm to the local health department, they are not required to to do to perform any regulatory action based only on that report. It may mean they want to go do an inspection themselves, in which case that's a whole different matter. But we're, we, we just, because in Massachusetts and the federal government, there are no standards for the amount of moisture or the am amount of mold, any of the numbers you see in those reports don't mean anything because we don't have anything in, in the law that says once it hits here, you have to do something. There is no here. So if a, if anybody gets the mold report, they don't have to do anything. Now, can the occupant go to court? Yep, they can always go to court and they may come after an owner saying, I want you to do the work based on this report. The court is its own entity. If they make a determination, something needs to be done, then that's up to the courts. Variances, we're not big favorites of vari variances. We put, put these requirements in here. And the main reason we, we're not a, a big fan of variances because as I said in the very beginning, these are minimum standards. And when you start saying you don't have to meet the bare minimum, there's going to be a problem there. Not to mention the fact that if you give it to one person, you're going to have to give it to everybody because they're going to have a very good suit against you. If you grant, yes, owner A, you don't have to do this anymore. And then B, C, D, and E come up and say, I want the same thing. Or the hope can't say no. So that's why we tell them to be very careful. They can't. The main restrictions for the Board of Health is they can't uh, grant the variance that contradicts a law. So if something's required by law, nobody can touch that except right to your legislature and try and get them to change. They can issue a variance when the enforcement would do manifest injustice. Manifest injustice is not spending money. Manifest injustice is if there's a new piece of equipment that does the same thing that is listed in the housing code, but the health department says no, because it's not in the housing code and you can prove it does the same thing, that's a manifest injustice. And that would, that would you could go to court on that and, and you would win that. The applicant has to provide same, de same degree of protection. You can't just say, I don't wanna do this because I don't wanna do this and I'm not doing anything else to ensure that it's gonna be safe. You're not gonna get anywhere with it. Uh, if insurance is used in the in the if the home is insured, then they have to be notified because you want to make sure that the insurance company is going to cover you should something happen. If they were to find out that there's there's been a variance and now it doesn't meet the code, they have pretty good argument to say well, we're not paying out anything. So this is your protection as well. Board of Health decision does not conflict with the spirit of the regulations. They have to follow what the guide what the regulations have. All affected parties are notified of the date, location, and time of a hearing. If someone asks for a variance, 
That means all affected parties would be the person who's asking for it, which is more than likely the owner, not always, but more than likely. And any of the occupants that are affected by that condition that was found, they all have a right to be heard and the local health department has to notify them all by statute. So they're not playing favorites, they have to notify everybody. And then the uh, petitioner is notified within three calendar days of the decision. We want to see, and this is a burden we put on local health, that we want a decision done quickly because nothing's happening while this is in the process. So let's get it over with one way or the other. Because at the hearing, the health department or hearing officer can uphold the order to correct, they can negate the entire order, or they can modify it and put different conditions. But that's got to be done quickly. It can't be dragged on and on and on. Uh, alternative housing, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just wanted to hit this one slide and explain to you that in a single family owner occupied residence, if the owner provides the correct information and all the information that the department uh, or the local board of health is requiring, they can permit a house which doesn't have traditional electrical service, plumbing, heating, minimum square footage, sanitary drainage, as long as all the approval goes through the Board of Health and any other agency that has authority over that. Like when you say sanitary drainage, that's the Department of Environmental Protection as well. So what this means is that if you have alternative means that are non-traditional to achieve the same goal as any of these, any of these agencies require and the Board of Health approves it, you can use it. It doesn't mean that if you live in a home or you're renting a single family, well, it has to be an owner. So if you live in a home, that's why I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. And your furnace breaks, you can't say, I wanna be alternative housing because I don't wanna put in a new furnace. So I'm gonna come up with this big wood stove. It's not, that's not what it's geared for. But because it's for single family owner occupied, I, I don't know if it's gonna be that big of a deal. Now, just a little bit more on the legal process and we're done. Uh, you have, everybody has a right to request a hearing. Any person who's aggrieved by receiving an order or notice and any affected person, such, such petition has to be filed within seven calendar days. If you get an order and you don't like it and you want a hearing, you got to file within seven days of when you got it. Any person who's aggrieved by the failure of an inspector to enforce the provisions of the regulations has to file within 45 calendar days. The maximum amount of time that can go for an order by regulation is 30 days. That doesn't mean it's only 30 days, the initial 30 day period. And then if there's substantial progress that they're satisfied with, they'll work with the owner and allow for more time. But in the beginning, it's not gonna go beyond 30 days. So this 45 days allows the occupant to realize maybe the Board of Health isn't gonna do anything. So that's when they're gonna go for a hearing. Uh, follow provision of the regulations and the approval of a variance provide such petition must be filed within 30 days. So if they if the Board of Health grants a variance, but they don't, they don't follow what's in the regulations, then anyone who's aggrieved by that decision, probably more than likely an occupant, they have a right to request a hearing for that. The hearings commence no later than 14 calendar days for trying to push boards of health or the hearing officer to get these things done quickly and not let it drag on. Failure to hold a hearing within the required time frame does not affect the validity of any order. In other words, if someone requests a hearing and it's not done in the proper time period, it does not automatically negate the order and everybody can go on their merry way. It has no effect on the validity of the order if nothing is ever heard. The final decision, Board of Health should notify the petitioner and affected parties whether they sustain, modify, or withdraw the order within five calendar days. Let's get this done. If sustained or modified, the order should carry it out in the time period allotted, means whatever the time period was, it's going to remain. If, since, if it is sustained in whole or in part, each day's failure to comply so constitute additional offense, which is no different. It's just spelled out. It's no different than if you go by, if, if you miss a 30-day order, every day is another violation. That's, that's just standard practice. That's nothing new. Condemnation, placarding, vacating, any resident shall be placarded as unfit for human habitation by the Board of Health a, when a written petition for a hearing is not filed within seven calendar days. If they, if they condemn it, you have a right to a hearing as the owner or after a hearing is, of condemnation is issued. So if you have the hearing and they uphold it and it's condemned, they can placard it right away. 
When a residence has been condemned and placarded as unfit for human habitation and the occupant of the resident is not the owner, the owner shall provide comparable suitable housing for the occupant for the following time period. They have to put them up somewhere if the owner is responsible for the violations, for the conditions. Remaining term of the lease, such time as the residence is deemed suitable and it's fixed, then go back, or the occupant finds another place to live, they voluntarily move. Voluntarily move. Um, and a claim for the expense incurred demolition of the residence by the Board of Health is a debt due to the municipality in accordance with MGL 127, which means if the Board of Health spends money on that building, then they have a right to lien the property to be reimbursed for that. Now, the first question that always comes up, what if it's a hoarding situation or something similar to that and the occupant's the one that caused the, the, the problem and and they still have to be ordered out. Does that mean as the owner, I'm on the hook? And the answer is no. If the occupant's responsible, then none of this, this doesn't hold and it has nothing to do with it. But if the building is in such bad shape that it hasn't been repaired, then it will be the owner's responsibility. That's all we have right now for the presentation. Did it in just six minutes longer than I normally do. And I guess if there, I see there's 15 Q and A, so I guess there's at least a few questions coming up. Yeah, we have quite a few. Um, okay. first, question, first question is, um, does this webinar qualify for AIA credits slash learning units? I don't know. I, I don't deal with any of that stuff. But some, um, they, uh, Regina or someone there is gonna have to look into that. I have no idea. I don't even, I don't know what that, what that um, AIA is anyhow. So, but I, I can't say one way or the other. Okay. Regina, would you happen to know? I'm sorry. Uh, we, we didn't petition AIA for CEUs on this. So um, we did not submit it. So I would say no, if you want to contact AIA, you could certainly have them get in touch with us. Okay. Thank you, Regina. Um, the next question. I have an apartment which is inspected which was inspected yesterday. The inspection failed because the Whirlpool jet in the bathtub fails to turn on. The tub is otherwise functional, fills and drains properly. Do I need to spend potentially thousands of dollars to get this fixed in order to pass inspection? You want me to do that, Regina? Please go ahead, Paul. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, answer is, yeah the answer is that it has to be fixed. Any any piece of equipment that is in there when there's an occupant has to be maintained. So the answer is yes. I don't know how much it's going to cost and um, it, it just has to be fixed. It has to be completely functioning as it was originally designed to function. Okay, thank you. Next question. Does the owner have to provide a key if it's an electronic keypad for the front door? Some keypad deadlocks also have key slots. Um, I think I think that either uh, ISD or DPH should answer that. That's a that's going to be kind of like a legal interpretation. And since I'm not an officer of DPH anymore, I don't think I should. I would, uh, in my own opinion, say it's probably okay. But you 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 should probably get a, an answer out of ISD or Boston. I so I, I think that the door is, if the keypad is operated with a keypad, then you're required to make sure the occupant can get in the way the lock is supposed to work. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question. Do light bulbs need to be provided in units by owners when they burn out? The, the light bulbs in, if, if let's say if it's a, the light bulbs within the unit are the responsibility of the occupant and the light bulbs on the exterior of the unit and common areas are the responsibility of the owner. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. I think you answered this earlier, but what is an owner to do if the occupant's sanitary conditions um, are basically contributing to the presence of pests? They, during an inspection, the um, the inspector will can cite both, and we've always we've always said anytime we've done training, do it. Uh, don't hold back. And if if the occupant's responsible for anything that 
that's contributing to it, they're on the hook as well. So, you know, they, they have to clean up. I don't know. I'm mean, then, you know, after that, you get into to civil issues. If the owner said, well, it costs me money and they should pay. Local health can't get into that. You'd have to go to court if you were seeking any kind of reimbursement. But they would certainly be cited and held accountable for cleaning up in order to do so. Okay, thank you. Um, what about deferred maintenance of neighbors in shared firewalls who have raccoons possibly coming into the neighboring properties? So you mean like in a, in a basement or something, if, if you've got the firewall in the basement and there's a hole and it's coming from one to the other? Sounds like I guess, it. I guess yeah. that's what they mean. Yeah. Well, I, see, that's, that's a problem with a shared wall, since it's a shared wall that if, if I were advising the inspector, I would, if, if it's, if they could determine that the other side was negligent, I would do them. But in all practical purposes, I would probably say, cite them both and get somebody to fix it and just dismiss against the other one. Okay. Um, roommates are common throughout the city. What is the maximum number of families in one unit which doesn't require a rooming house designation? That's our favorite. <laughs> Would you need you guys have any requirements on that? Anything that wouldn't be covered by square footage in the code? Yeah, um, this is a, a, a very case by case because there's uh, the definition of a family is very broad these days. Um, mm -hmm. So if there are people are living as a family unit in the same uh, residence, as long as they meet the minimum square footage required, you know, our, our hands are really limited and tied. So that's not an easy question to answer. It has to be case by case. The other thing to understand too, is that when, as I said, right in the beginning, the code looks at occupants and it's, it doesn't, we don't, the DPH doesn't look at it as a family unit. They look at it as the number of occupants and is there enough square footage based on the number of people? Um, I, like I said, Boston probably has something that treats it a little different. The, the housing code itself is pretty basic when it comes to that. And the, any community can either adopt the code or they can form their own bylaws that are stricter than the code. They have that authority. So it's that's one for ISD to work with you on. Thank you. Um, Paul, someone's um, asking for access to the slides rather than the video. I'm not sure. I'll send, I can send the slides over and mm -hmm. if you guys want to, could you guys take care of getting it out or posting it yeah. on your site? You, yeah. I, mean, I, I don't care if you post it. I, I have no objections. It's public. It's been public record for almost a year now. So <laughs> okay. I'll send it over and you guys do with it what you want. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, next question. For a multi-unit condo building where one of the units is rented out by a single unit owner, not the condo association. Who is responsible for ensuring that the ex external walls are sealed to prevent pests from encroaching into the spaces between the external and internal walls of the building? That's always the owner's responsibility to maintain structural elements. Okay, thank you. Can the city force an inspection when the tenant and owner do not want strangers inside the apartment uninvited? Paul, I think this goes to our rental program. So it, yep. it goes into the um, rental registration and inspection ordinance that's by the city. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the um, the person asking the question needs to review the ordinance that was passed by city council. If they okay. have to, they can certainly bring it up to their city councilor. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Regina. Okay, next question. I do not see the slides on the website. We just received um, permission to post the slides. So um, they should be up by Friday, if not Monday, the latest. <laughs> I haven't sent them over yet. So <laughs> they're on my computer right now, in case you're wondering why Boston doesn't have them. It's on my computer. I have to send them over to them. Okay. Which Next I question. Do. What is the scope of ap applicability and enforcement of the BOH code for single family owner occupied homes, which are not rented out? Code applies to every every residence, whether it's owner occupied or rented. Okay. Same same thing applies. There's no difference. 
Yeah, and we will um, post the slides <laughs> on our website. Um, have, has the city of Boston rental inspection requirements changed as a result of the updated sanitary codes? If so, what are some of the changes? How are landlords being informed of these changes? As the rental inspection, okay, sorry. Yeah, the, the rental inspection requirements are based on the state sanitary code. So, and you're being informed right now by us doing webinars and trying to educate property owners now. But the changes are the same as the state sanitary code. The ordinance follows the state sanitary code. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, and that's the email address from Annette. Access to electrical electric panels. I've had tenants that tamper with water heaters, et cetera. Do I need to let them have access to the basement? They have to have access to the electrical panel. If you want to, if you have to do some walls or something to protect them, then you probably should if they're doing damage, but they have to have access. If it's in the basement, if they're paying for the electricity, they have to have access. If you're paying for the electricity, then you're the one that lets them into it, but they still have to be able to get to it. But they have to have access. Okay. I would put a camera down there if that's the case. Yeah. Um, in addition, some tenants do not let you into their units to do an inspection or a walkthrough. What should they do? I can tell you through my experience is I I would walk through I, and if I if, when I had a problem with one, I would do periodic walkthroughs. And if they had told me that I can't go through, I would have gone to court and got an order because I own the property and with legal notice, I have a right to enter my own property as far as I can see. I don't know if everyone in the housing court agrees, but it used to be the owner has a right to go in if they see fit, not to harass, but if they have a legitimate reason, they have every right with proper notice. And I would just add to that for them to check their leasing agreement, what, what's actually signed yeah. to them a lease. Yep. Okay. As I said in the beginning, if you set the set legal terms in the lease right up front, you've got a you've got a lot of lot going for you, a lot supporting you that way. Okay. Um, the next question sounds like it's probably a uh, for a building inspector, but I'll ask it anyways. Hi, if I have an enclosed porch that is 14 feet long and six feet wide and has a sloped ceiling where the lowest point is six and a half inches. And the highest point is 7.5 inches. Can I use it as a bedroom? Is that more for a building or building? Well, plans there, there is a requirement in the housing code that talks about ceiling height. And I would just have them check that out because it doesn't sound like if it's six feet, six feet wide and it's only six and a half inches high, then it, I don't think you're going to be able to meet the minimum uh, height because you have to have you have to have 75% um, of the bill of it has to be at seven feet, three quarters of it has to be at three feet, at um, seven feet. And yeah, they no say the highest, they're saying the highest point is 7.5 inches. Yeah, no, it's gotta be feet. Okay, okay. If it's only seven inches high in the beginning, the, in, at the highest point, you can't put anything in there, so. Yeah, it's kind it's of- It's gotta confusing. be feet. Yeah, so if, it, to... if it goes if it goes seven feet in the peak to six and a half feet on the outside, uh, you're still going to have to do the measurements. But it sounds like I, I can't say what it sounds like because you have to get to a point and find out where the seven feet comes down and what's the minimum square footage and is that enough? I I can't I can't say no without I can't say one or the other without seeing the measurements. It's just there's no way to no way to tell without seeing it and measuring it. But okay. it's in the code. It is right in the code for under uh, habit, habit, habitability requirements, <laughs> where it talks about how to measure the ceiling height. So it's right in there. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Andy. We went into a lot of mold questions. What is the remedy when an owner has been notified repeatedly of mold and they and the fixes have been insufficient and has been inspected multiple times? Um, this sounds like this could, it's, 
is, is this is this an occupant asking the question? Because they would have a right, they would have a right to 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 go after the owner in court. But I'm not not sure I quite understand if yeah. if it has to keep be if it has to constantly be cited, then the ISD is going to have to keep going after them, and there may be other other conditions they have to put in place. I don't I don't know. I, that's, yeah. I the question's a little. It's kind of hard to follow, to be yeah. honest with you. Andy, maybe, um, Andy, can you give us a call at 635-5300 tomorrow and ask to speak to someone in the housing division and um, maybe we can help you yeah. Um, yeah. better that way? Okay. Yeah. I, I'd just like to bring in at this point um, with the, the new parameters in uh, the sanitary code, housing code, um, about having to get dried, um, and the extent of work when it comes to mold, if there's something, if there's something that's chronically happening, then you tear down the wall and let's, uh, the ceiling and you find that there's uh, an air conditioning duct that keeps dripping. And that's what's being cited over and over again. Then the property owner really isn't addressing the source and something has to be done about the air conditioning duct. So there's um there's some leverage with the clarification in the sanitary code now. So maybe if it's something that continuously happens in the same area, it's something we can get behind in addressing the source as opposed to just repairing the surface. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Jose. What laws and policies are there for unoccupied properties? My next door property has been empty and neglected for the past 15 years. The inheritors have done bare minimum since original owner died. Well, the, if it that that falls under a couple of couple of areas, the housing code would apply if it's if the property is in a condition that's causing danger uh, dangerous situations to the public. There's also called a nuisance statute, where if it's attracting, uh, like kids want to keep get, getting in there, or if it's used for Ill um, illicit drug use or something, then the police could come in. So there's a number of different ways that a, an abandoned property can be addressed. It, there are a number of regulations that they can go go after, um, including the the um, community that not the community inspectional services could seek in court to have a, a receiver appointed and let them fix it up and sell it if it's abandoned. So there's there's a number of different things that can be done. Okay. Um, yeah, I think Jose, if you want to uh, tomorrow also, you can call the department 65-5300. Ask for calling um, Kennedy. I believe she is now in charge of our foreclosed uh, abandoned property um, division and she'll be able to help you that way as well. Um, the next question, are there such health violations considered non-dangerous? Do the enforcement process and required timeframes from remediation vary for such non-dangerous health violations? Well, anything that's a violation of the code is, 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 a, is a condition that needs to be repaired. And the, the, num the amount of time that the repairs are ordered for, like the time frame can vary anywhere from one day to 30 days. As I was saying at one point, the maximum of your initial order is going to be 30 days. But if there's significant process of uh, progress and the inspector and ISD say you're doing well, we can we can work with you for more time. They have the they have the authority to do that. But the code states if there's any violation found, then it has to be repaired. Now there has to be serious violations before you would get into the process of finding it unfit for human habitation and possibly condemning in order vacating, they have to be very serious, more life-threatening than um, the screens are up. You know, I mean, both would have to be cited, but that's how far you're gonna carry it. It depends on the severity. Okay. I think the um, question that the Mount Pleasant and Forest Hill, Forest Vine Association asked in regards to the, um, rodent with the um what was it the, the retaining wall or what have you or the connecting wall yeah. they're saying yeah. that it was in a shared tunnel in the crawl space a shared tunnel 
shared tunnel in crawl space. I think they're going to just have, you should probably call or have somebody um, email us or call us tomorrow yeah. with that. And maybe yeah. um, we can help you a little bit more. Well, just, just off the cuff, if it's shared, then both are responsible if it's shared. So. Okay. Um, they asking about minimum square footage. I'm not sure about what that means. Um, there's a pile of trees, limbs, shrubbery in my neighbor's yard, and I've seen my with my own eyes rats going into that pile. What can I do? I hate to call ISD on a neighbor or have ISD come out if not an emergency. And that's from Annette. So and that you can probably call ask them. Community right? sanitation. You can call community sanitation. She doesn't it, want to call us. If she doesn't want to call us, and I mean she could probably have a conversation with her neighbor. If not, maybe. She can help them or work with them to clean it up? Well, what she needs to understand is if, and I understand she may not want to call, but the, the local health authority, if they can confirm that that's a harborage for rodents, then they can do something about it. But if it's just a pile of brush and they can't say, unless there's a local ordinance that the yard has to be cleaned, there's, there's not much that can be done. But the not much at all is going to be done if, she doesn't act in one way or the other, talk to the neighbor or, or something, but it's not going to go away by itself, I guess is the best way to say it. Video is best to show members in our community. I don't know what that's Proper notice being 24 hour letter, question mark. That's from Annette. Well, it depends. If it's if it's one of the conditions deemed to endanger, then the Board of Health has 12 hours to get an order out to require repair within or make a good faith effort within 24 hours. But the only thing you have to understand is it can take a couple of days to get the service. So it's from when they get they receive the order. And then besides the 24 hour, it can go out to 30 days. So it's, I mean, legal service is how it's served. The time frame is on the severity of the violations, but the housing code is specific on which violations have to be ordered uh, for a 24-hour repair. And that's right in the, the code under timeframes. It's in the back, eight, it's in the 800 section. Okay, and Frank has a couple of questions, um, follow-up questions we got in that um, edition, I guess, that he was asking. I would just, um, Frank, I would suggest you call or come in, come into yeah. our um, department, 1010 Mass Ave, fifth floor, and um, go to counter two. And you can talk with the plans examiner and they may be able to help you with um, some of these questions, okay? Um, the next question, how do how does these landlords get away with renting roach mice? Okay, so um, they're finding a, an appeal, if finding is appealed and a 30 day repair notice is given and an appeal is not heard within the 14 day window, how does the impact the repair timeframe? It doesn't. You still have to make the repairs within 30 days. If you're saying you haven't had a hearing within the 14 day window, the order still holds. Okay. Do you remember I put us, there was a slide in there that said if they, if it doesn't happen within 14 days, the order is still in effect. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, the Mount Pleasant Forest and Vine Association, they did come back and saying that it's actually not shared. It's the, I guess the rodent or what have you. They're coming in through the hole in their building and got into the adjacent space through their crawl space connected to the chimney stack. So they yeah, should they, probably yeah. request an inspection. Yeah. How's, you know, it, it, it sounds it. like, it sounds like the, the building that they're talking about, the rodent came in somehow, the raccoon came in somehow. Well, whosever property it is, whosever wall it is, that person is responsible for sealing up the wall. And let's say the, it got into a crawl space that's shared and then came up the chimney stack of somebody on that budding property. The person who owns the chimney stack is responsible for getting rid of the raccoon and however the raccoon accessed the chimney. So um, it, it's hard to 
to tell from this scenario that's being laid out the configuration, but if it's there's a shared responsibility, both parties will be cited to make the repairs and get someone to get rid of the raccoon. Okay, thank you. And Annette did come back um, to clarify. Um, she wanted to know if 24 hours is okay to give a tenant notification to enter the unit for inspection. You mean for the owner to give notice? I believe so. It's, there's no, I, I think it's a, I'm trying to think if 48 is, is suggested or if it's a requirement, I don't, I don't remember. Um, typically it's usually what you're looking at in those situations is if it's if it's 24 hour notice is it a convenient time for the person to come in like not four o'clock in the morning or late at night i think 24 might work but the kind of the unwritten law is 48 hours but i i don't know if there's case law that could make a ruling on that it's it's kind of up in the air once again, with this one, I would refer the property owner back to their lease, what what, what they have in the yep. leasing agreement with the occupant. And yep. usually uh, people who call into the housing division will tell them property owners mm -hmm. to give the occupant written notification at least 24 to 48 hours in advance. Yep. People have lots of things going on um, unless it was an emergency situation. And then I, I would refer the property owner back to their lease again as to what it allows on an emergency situation. Okay, thank you, Regina. Um, for water temperature adjustments, 110 Fahrenheit to 120, um, when should the owners complete these, these adjustments? Um, yeah, do it now. It's in effect, so. Okay. Um, so um, for notices of tenants' rights, do you have the link? If you go to mass.gov slash CSP, it'll take you to the community sanitation page and click on the housing bullet and all of the forms, guidance documents, interpretations, Everything is right there for you to just download and print right off the site. Mass.gov slash CSP. All right, looks like we answered most of the questions, if not um, through the Q&A, through the um, slides. Um, is there anything else that you guys want to um, share before we sign off? Um, I don't have anything, just I appreciate your time. Okay. Regina, Leanne? We're all set. Okay. Thank all right, you. well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, special thank you to our special guest, Paul Hoff, uh, Hoffman. It was great to have you, very informative. Um, again, all this information will be posted on our website, and the video will be posted on um, Boston Spectral Services YouTube. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Thank you. Good night.